and welcome back. Now let's actually think about what happens under the hood. So we've talked about the software level, so we're talking about parallelism in many ways, and now we're saying, okay, we've handled the C part, we know how to do OMP, uh, OpenMP, you know how to handle race conditions, you know what deadlock is and how to grab semaphores and locks. What actually happens with the, with the issue of level one, level two, level three caches? Level three is maybe shared, memory is shared, level one and level two is separate. What happens when you have shared memory and caches? This gets a little more complicated. So let's actually look at the hardware side of this, what's actually happening. So this is on a chip. I've got my CPUs, my cores. Each of them has uh, a memory bus. I've got other devices, I've got main memory. And in a model that is a symmetric multiprocessor, so this is a memory of a multi-core machine, two or more identical cores, I've got a single shared coherent memory. So again, I have each of these guys above, the, above this line, above the memory bus are my cores, and below the line is the memory that I'm sharing. Um, and each one might have various levels of caches that are shared or not shared, depending. Um, so there's a general question. This is a general question for any computing system, any multiprocessor system. This isn't just this particular one CPU how to do this. It might be how do I have two different chips and how do they communicate? It might be you know worker bees doing something. Question one is how do they share data? How do these guys share data back and forth? How do they coordinate their operations? And how many processors can be supported? How big can we go? How wide can I go in terms of the number of helpers I have? So. In SMP, or shared memory multiprocessors, what we've been talking about along, I have a shared address space. So we mentioned that before, that the first slide I showed you, memory is shared, that zero to four to, you know, zero to four Gibby is shared among all of them. And they're gonna communicate via these shared variables in memory, okay? From via loads and stores. That's the only way for me to, to, to work. Um, and you have to then synchronize that some way, and we talked about hardware synchronization or locks to be able to make sure you're not having two people think that they have right control over that, and that's great. And all multi-core computers now are SMP, or shared memory multiprocessors. Caches, so caches becomes the really interesting thing. Um, you knew that memory was a performance bottleneck. That's not new information. Memory was going to Sacramento. Even with one processor, that was a trouble. Um, we brought in caches to, to reduce that pain uh, and to reduce the bandwidth demands on main memory so that now, which is nice, imagine, you know, that's the reason we had, even back in the olden days, we had two uh, data instruction caches so that both of them could be hit at once, and that's great. It's almost like you're paralyzing you're using this. You're, you're being able to, to have... Um, them both be used in the same clock cycle. We've learned that, right? The PC can be, you know, you're re looking up some new value, the rising edge of the clock, and you go grab a new, what's the new instruction? I don't know, where is it? Well, go point in memory. Well, do I have to go to second memory? No, because it's in my instruction level one cache. Great, boom. At the same time, I might be asking, I'm doing a load word, I'm reading from data cache. At the same exact instruction, I'm doing those at the same day. Great, I might be you know, at the fifth, fourth stage of doing a load word, and I'm at the first stage of the next guy, and they're the same line, and they both can happen at the same time. So I love, so we already know that you can kind of split sometimes, split caches, be able to work at the same time without having a resource bottleneck. We've seen that already. So, uh, and and uh, each core has a private cache. We've known that already. We've known that already. Um, only cache misses. Only when you have a miss do you need to go past the cache to go into the shared space. You're in your local stuff. I'm in my local, we know that at least L1, L2. I'm here and only when I miss that do I need to go. And maybe there's some more compl complexity if it's shared L3, but I only really need to, forget L3 for a moment, how I need to worry about memory. Once I miss my, for now we're just gonna say there's one local cache and then there's one memory. So let's make it easy. I still have the same problems that come up with L1 and L2 and L3, but let's talk about just having one cache and memory and only cache, only when I miss my cache, well, I need to go to memory, and now it's the shared space, okay? So think about this. Everybody, here's the simplest simplest case. Everybody has their own cache. Again, there's maybe the L1 and L2 here, and I don't worry about the L3 for now, and they all have to go through the interconnect memory to get to the shared space of memory, all right? So that's all the same. So now let's actually do a simple case. Processor one and two, just reads for now. Easy, easy, easy. Processor one and two read memory location 100, and they wanna get the value 20. So let's actually animate this. This is kind of fun. So. Here's processor one. Address is 100, sorry, 1,000. Memory value 1,000. So here we go. Is it in my cache? No, it's not. So I go to memory. I grab it. What's its value? 20. I come on back, and I go back, and I put it in my cache for future reference, and I remember that you know, at 1,000, I've got a 20, and we're good. Processor two does the same thing. You can already see that there might be an optimization where processor two can look in processor one's cache, but we don't have that place. They only have to go through memory. That's the only way to, to, they don't, that's the only way to communicate for now. So the same thing happens. 
Processor one says, I want to read value of memory of 1,000. I want to get, I think it's a 20, but I don't know. I want to get the value. So again, check the cache is not there. Go to memory, grab it, and come on back, and 20 is there, and I remember it's 1,000. So good. So far, so good. Everything's fine. And each one of them has a copy, right? So this is the issue. Each one now has a copy. There wasn't an issue before. I mean, before it was an issue of, you know, do we do a write back or write through in terms of keeping our cache and memory synchronous? We allowed it to be asynchronous. We allowed it to get kind of uh, stale, right? We have a dirty bit for that. But now you've got an issue that both of them have a copy, which is fine as long as the same value. What happens if they change? Okay. So now what happens if processor zero comes around and writes memory 1000 with a 40? Here we go. Let's try it. So got 1000. Is it in the cache? Nope, not there, so write it in the cache. And we're gonna make sure in this particular situation we're gonna have a write through. So we're gonna actually have to write it all the way through. We're not gonna write back where we keep them stale and you know, have, it, have it be dirty. I'm gonna say write through. So now there's my 1,040, that's great. Note that processor one and two have their 20, which is the wrong value. And then, yoink, I write it through. You told me to write through, I'm processor zero. What do you want from me over here? I write it through. Can you see a problem? Anybody see a problem? Wait, let's just pause here and everyone should see a problem here. <laughs> Processor zero says, hey, the value at 1,000 is 40. Processor one and two say, nope, it's 20. That's a really big deal. So that's in this lecture. I'm setting you up for, I love the cliffhanger. It's kind of a cliffhanger approach like, you know, Mandalorian, what happens to baby Yoda? So there's not, we're there the cliffhanger here. What happens? How do we resolve this? That's the next lecture. We'll see you there.